Okay, congratulations, uh, all of you. So, shifting gears a little bit, but not fully, because of course this, uh, this, uh, all of this continues on. I just want to take a moment to uh, introduce you to the lecture and to our um, our lecturer uh, today. Uh, so I get to do this because I am um, a co-chair of the speakers uh, program here. And I want to make a couple of uh, acknowledgements as we get started um, this afternoon. Uh, I want to begin, as always, by acknowledging that we are here on Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We respect our, uh, we want to pay our respect to our First Nations and Métis ancestors and colleagues and reaffirm our relationships uh, among uh, each other. I also want to acknowledge the support that we get from the McKercher Law Firm for putting on this lecture series. We're very grateful for, uh, for their backing for all of this. So uh, now to turn to the, today's event, which is the 2020 Shumiatcher Lecture on Law and Literature, Harry Potter Goes to, the Law, Harry Potter Goes to Law School. Uh, I think that this event comes at a good time. We, uh, uh, throughout the course of the year, we deal with some very serious issues in, in the lecture series, and that's one of the things that we... Uh, uh, one of our objectives is to bring outside speakers um, on on uh, current topics and difficult issues in today's justice arena to law, law students and to the public. And uh, I'm very glad that today we can take a broader look at uh, narratives and stories and uh, something that may feel a bit more lighthearted, um, but carries some very important lessons and values that may resonate with all of you. And I think that's that's one of the reasons why we're very excited that Lenora took up our invitation to come and speak. Lenora Ledwin is a law professor at St. Thomas University School of Law in Miami. She has her JD from the University of Michigan Law School and her PhD in English Literature from the University of Notre Dame. Her book, and I want to mention a couple of her books because I think this shows her dedication to this very fascinating topic. Her book, Law and Literature, Text and Theory, looks at the relationship between law and literature and the importance of narrative in shaping our understanding of law. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we're excited to present the Law and Literature lecture every couple of years because the themes of narrative and storytelling are very much deeper themes uh, around the lawyer's work uh, or that surround the lawyer's work and, and the evolution of justice. And um, so I think it's very interesting to look at, uh, to look at the arena through that lens. Um, Lenora is uh, also co-editor of a casebook on law and popular culture, and uh, which again will include many themes which will be uh, familiar to all of you, and has published in many different journals on uh, topics around this, uh, around this area. And I think with that, I'll just turn it over to Lenora and invite uh, her to take us into the world of Harry Potter and how justice appears in that, uh, in that landscape. Do you, would you like that or would you like, do you want the mic here? Okay. All right, well thank you so much for having me here. It's really an honor to be invited to speak. And I wanted to start with a question. Uh, just maybe from a show of hands, who here will be the first lawyer in your immediate family? Just like a, a show of hands. Wow, quite a few folks. All right, good for you. Hey, going into the unknown, learning something new. So let me just see. So you, you had raised your hand, sir, yes? Um, you will be the first lawyer in your family. What did you think law school would be like before you started? Didn't even want to have it a guess. No clue. No. <laughs> okay. Into the unknown. Right? This is like this frozen two song. Okay. So very intrepid. So, and should I ask which house you would sort yourself into if you, or which house the sorting hat would put you in? I don't think I can think of like Ravenclaw. Or Ravenclaw. Okay. Or maybe Gryffindor also. That's very brave to, to go to law school. And who else was, is the first person in their family? 
to become a lawyer. Okay, yes, ma'am. How about you? What did you think law school would be like in the black, the black shirt? Yeah. What did, what did you think? Okay. Uh, I love that you used a pop culture example. You were you were saying, well, I've seen, I've heard some stories about law school and popular culture. I've I've watched How to Get Away with Murder, and I've maybe seen some things that might alarm me a little bit. <laughs> law school uh, might be competitive, right? It might be cutthroat. Um, I hope that it won't be as unethical as many of the things that happen on How to Get Away with Murder are. Uh, so. You, you didn't have folks in your family um, who would tell you, uh, oh, this is what law school would be like, but you're willing to, to attempt this new project. And it's, a, it's, a, another, it's an area of education, a new area of education. Did you think that you would be changed in law school? <laughs> ah, okay. You didn't think you would be changed, but now you feel maybe you have been transformed somehow. You're on this road to transformation. Uh, it's a journey. It's a process. And a few of you who didn't raise your hands, you must have uh, a few people who have lawyers in the family. Right? Did anyone tell you what to expect in law school if you are not the first lawyer in your family? Did anyone say, it's going to be a lot of hard work or it's going to be really frightening or something's going to happen that uh, you, might, you might be called on the first day? My dad was a lawyer. He was a lawyer for 60 years in Detroit. And he didn't tell me anything about law school other than he said, one professor complimented on his Latin, complimented him on his Latin. And that really alarmed me because I did not take Latin before I went to law school. So I was like, well, I'm doomed already. I don't know what's, you know, what's going to happen here. Um, lots of times, if we are not sure what uh, law school will be like, we turn to popular culture, right? We turn to stories. Um, we turn to uh, movies like Legally Blonde. We turn to um, How to Get Away with Murder. And what happens during law school is a bit of a transformation. Right? So you are imagining a professional identity for yourself, where you're thinking, I am going to become a lawyer. And you have to imagine what that looks like and what that will mean. You have to imagine who do I want to be. Uh, before I came, I pulled up a couple of pictures from my law school's view book. We have this view book that we give to prospective students. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like a, you know, this is an introduction to St. Thomas Law School. These are some things that you would be doing as a law student. And, and these are some of the pictures that I saw in there. And I think this is fairly typical of view books. I bet that you have one like this, maybe online or maybe a physical book. Uh, and you will see, well, here's a picture of a couple of law students engaging in a trial practice class. Right? So they're actually practicing becoming lawyers. They're practicing becoming lawyers. And there's another picture of uh, law students talking with professors, right? meeting professors, talking with them, learning from them. Uh, and there were several pictures of recent alumni looking very professional, right, in suits right, and in ties, standing in front of law books. They have acquired this new professional identity, this new power. And there were also a number of pictures of students studying, right, students in the library studying. Okay. So during law school, you acquire a professional identity. I just want you to eyeball this quote for a moment from... Carl Llewellyn's The Bramble Bush. That's kind of a frightening quote when we think about it. Uh, um, he's particularly talking about the first year of law school, the process of learning to think like a lawyer. We think, what does it mean to think like a lawyer? It means to be objective and analytical and uh, being able to argue both sides and maybe almost being a little cold-blooded, right? So losing a little bit of humanity, right? Not saying, oh, this is, this is the person that should win, but being able to say, well, here's the arguments on both sides. Uh, so this is kind of a, a scary uh, idea. Okay, law school stories in popular culture. 
these are some of the places that you might have turned to before you came when you're thinking, well, what is law school going to be like? You know, what's going to happen there? Um, the process of imagining a professional identity begins before you come to law school. And it includes fictional stories about what this somewhat intimidating educational process will be. Uh, and I'm going to also mention that I think law school stories are especially significant now, particularly because of what's been happening in legal education in the United States recently. So post-recession, um, there was, since about 2007, law schools in the U.S. have faced a huge decline in applications. At one point in a 10-year period, there was almost a 40% decline in applications. Um, there's been a little bit of an uptick lately, what my admissions director tells me, that's part of the Trump bump, that some, there's been a 1% increase that some more students are coming because they're becoming more engaged uh, in politics. Um, but it's important to think about law school stories because we are facing some, uh, some variety of crises in applications, particularly in the United States. So if you're thinking about law school stories that you might have seen, and you already mentioned a couple, like How to Get Away with Murder, but basically they have these elements. Education will be key. That'll be key to the story, education. It's a story about the protagonist's initiation into a profession. And also a story about the protagonist's moral and intellectual development during law school. So really it's a story about transformation. Right? And we are transformed when we come to law school. Whether we like it or not, we are transformed. I remember my first year of law school, right, the most you know, stressful year, I had actually a nightmare. Um, and it sounds kind of funny when I describe it, but it was very frightening at the time. Um, I dreamed that I was getting a brain transplant, right? It was like this Frankenstein lab, and I was actually getting a new brain. And I was concerned. I thought, I hope I don't lose myself. I'm going to be gaining something, but I want to make sure that I have myself. So transformation. Um, the er story for law school is the paper chase. And when we're thinking about the messages that, of power and privilege that law school stories send us, we start with the paper chase. This, this is the highly influential, it's, probably, it's one of the first stories about law school. It's almost uh, 50 years uh, old now. And th uh, should I ask, dare I ask this, has anyone read the paper chase or seen the paper chase? There's a few, okay, okay, there we go. There we go, there's a few. Um, very few of my law students have read this, but uh, the, the title, or the cover sort of gives it away also, this transform, transformation. You see this paper airplane, and um, what, what the backstory is, is there's a first year law student at Harvard, and he's, he, he's coming to Harvard like coming to Oz, <laughs> and he wants to become transformed. And he studies hard, and he works hard, and he, he he's finally gets his grades in the mail, and then he makes a little paper airplane and throws the grades out to sea because the paper is not what's important. What's important is the transformation inside. So the paper chase is the most influential law school story that's out there, and it's, and it's almost 50 years old right now. Um, I remember reading it, and uh, I, there, I noticed a couple of key tropes in it. One key trope, only elite law schools matter. This, was said at Harvard, and no other schools are mentioned. So I say, well, there's only one law school in the world, right? And it must be Harvard. Another key trope, law school is competitive, and it's cutthroat. Professors are aloof, right? and professors are all men, and they're all white men, and the students are all men, and they're all white men. This was sort of the tropes from uh, the paper chase. Oh, and the only teaching method is the Socratic method, the Socratic method. So uh, a film version was made of Paper Chase, wonderful film, John Houseman as the intimidating contracts professor, the first year contracts professor. And we get this crucial scene from the film. First year of contracts, first year student stands up and he gets humiliated during the Socratic method. He is not prepared. He's not prepared for class. He, he attempts to answer and then he runs out after class and goes to vomit in the bathroom. He's so stressed from this whole Socratic enterprise. Uh, if you look at the, the film, also you see that, again, it's primarily men and primarily white men. 
But this is the primal scene in the law school story. This is the primal scene. Okay, let's fast forward a couple decades. Should I see how many students have seen Legally Blonde? <laughs> Almost everyone, all right, including professors, all right. Um, this is updated. We see, okay, now we have a female law student. We have a female law professor. She's teaching uh, Civ Pro. Holland Taylor is teaching Civ Pro there. But the same primal scene. It's the same primal scene. Elle Woods is sitting there in the front row, and she's not prepared, and she gets called on. And what happens? She gets kicked out of class. Okay, so again, this primal scene. Okay, let's fast forward another couple of, another decade or so to how, how to get away with murder. Oops, am I buzzing a little bit? No? It's okay. okay. It's not me? <laughs> okay, all right, I was gonna do some gymnastics, but okay. All righty, um, how to get away with murder. Boy, this, is this a, a fun show, it's, and it's bonkers, right? How to get away with murder, and wonderful Viola Davis as the law professor as rock star. Right? You, you kind of uh, have to love her uh, as, as uh, this very powerful uh, character. But think about the law school tropes. Again, it's an elite law school. It's an unnamed law school, but it's supposed to be a very elite law school. There's ultra-competitive students. Um, there is a more diverse cast, uh, and I'm going to put a question mark there. I'm going to show you in a minute why uh, this might not be as diverse as we think. There's a rigorous, demanding professor, and she encourages cutthroat competition. She says things like this. Okay. There's, there's no camaraderie. She says, the standout in class, the one it should be your mission to destroy, is that person. So we say, whoa. Okay, uh, but we do have an African-American uh, professor. Um, but there's more diversity. Um, she is also a professor of a, of a certain age. She's supposed to be about 50. Um, she's also bisexual. Everyone loves her, men, women, everyone loves uh, this professor. Um, the cast looks quite diverse, uh, uh, ethnicities, uh, genders. There's gay students. Um, but there's one way I think they're not diverse. Do you notice anything about this? Any similarity? Yeah. They're all skinny. They're all beautiful. And say, well, of course, that's law school. We're all beautiful. We are all beautiful, too. But um, again, so for uh, the television, right, it's a, it's a very beautiful cast. OK. There are some sort of ethical problems with the show. If we think about what Annalise Keating would do, Annalise is the name of the professor played by Viola Davis, the great Viola Davis. Uh, here's some typical dialogue. So the professor sort of encourages means, means justify the end. Do anything that you can in order to win. She even awards a statue of justice to the best student on each assignment. And the students fight bitterly over that statue, but they're fighting over the thing, over the physical object, not over the ideal. Right? They're fighting over the thing itself. They're not really fighting over justice, at least in the first few seasons. And actually, of course, ironically, that becomes a murder weapon at one point, that the statue of justice becomes a murder weapon. So how to get away with murder? The professor is kind of an anti-Perry Mason. There's another blast from the past. Any, any Perry Mason fans? A few, okay, there's a few. All right, there's just a few. Perry Mason, um, there, there was a series of novels written by Earl Stanley Gardner featuring Perry Mason. Perry Mason was a lawyer whose clients were always innocent, and Perry Mason always found out, you know, he, he acted as a detective. He found out the way to solve the case, and he got the witness to break down on the stand. Viola Davis's character in How to Get Away with Murder is kind of an anti-Perry Mason because her clients are pretty much always guilty, at least in the first four seasons, <laughs> and, and how to get away with murder, right? to get away with something. Um, Annalise and her students um, always uh, get these clients off the hook, and there's shocking ethical and legal violations, um, which actually is unprofessional. right? She breaks a number of rules of professional uh, responsibility right and left throughout the series, but she is ultra competent. So her students will say things like this, I want to be her. Okay, so again, imagining a professional identity, imagining who we will be, what will happen to us when we acquire this power of being 
lawyers. Okay, so contemporary law school stories are, are complicated. On the pro side, there's more diversity. There's more access to power and privilege in, in um, the more contemporary stories. But on the con side, it's the more cynical ends justify the means story that achieves the popular success. So the ideal is ultra competence, right? Ultra competence. So over the last 45 years or so, we can say, well, law school stories have been more inclusive. It's not just straight white men as law students and as professors. Uh, there's more activity outside the classroom. Learning takes place outside the classroom. But we still have a lot of these old tropes. We still have always just elite law schools. There's a lot of competition, not cooperation between students. There's this drive to win. So imagining a professional identity. Right? Who do I want to be? Not too many of my students have read Paper Chase. Some of them have seen Legally Blonde, and a few more have seen How to Get Away with Murder. But almost all of them are familiar with Harry Potter. Okay? Almost all of them are familiar with Harry Potter. Last summer, my law school hosted uh, a, a luncheon for incoming students. And I was chatting with a few of them, and I mentioned that I teach Harry Potter in my law and literature seminar. And not one, not two, but three students came up to me to show me their Harry Potter tattoos. Okay? So one had a tattoo of uh, the, his glasses, one had a tattoo of the lightning bolt scar, another one had um, the Deathly Hallows, which was very cool as a tattoo. <laughs> and I'm not gonna ask uh, which, who amongst you has a tattoo, but you might you know, ask your buddies later on if anyone has any Harry Potter tattoos. Um, and several of the students also told me which house they belonged to. Many of them had taken the Sorting Hat quiz online on the Powdermore website, which uh, J.K. Rowling uh, started. It was the official website. And at one point, it had 9 million accounts whose users had all completed a Sorting Hat quiz. So let's just do a quick quiz. <laughs> and I know that you were sorted for the, the, the trivia contest, but who do you think or excuse me, where would the sorting hat place you? Right, let's just see. So you, we're gonna do a, a show by hands. We have Gryffindor for the brave. Hey, we have Slytherin for the ambitious. We have Ravenclaw for the bright, Hufflepuff for the loyal and hardworking. So where are my Gryffindors? Where do we have Gryffindors? There's gotta be a few more than that. It, where do you think the sorting hat would place you? Oh, there's only a couple of Gryffindors. Okay, interesting. This is interesting. Okay, uh, Ravenclaw. Quite, a, oh, several more Ravenclaws. All right, Ravenclaw for the bright, yes. Uh, Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff, all right, we have a number of Hufflepuffs, right? Loyal, hard, friendly, hardworking. How about Slytherin? And we have a number of Slytherin. I always find that so interesting. And several of the students kept and told me very proudly that they were in Slytherin. Oops, did we? Lose something. I'm going to seek help here. So do not be ashamed if you are in Slytherin. <laughs> Remember that Snape was in Slytherin, and he actually turns out to be quite heroic. Okay, all right. Okay, so. Law students read Harry Potter. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry looks very much like a Harvard Law School for Wizards. It's a school where students learn the words of power. Right? They learn the magic words of power. Both types of, law, both types of school, oh. a wizard school and a law school, offer explicit and implicit lessons about power, its acquisition, and its uses. But remember, words of magic, words of power, can be tools for good or tools for evil, right? So when we are thinking, there we go. Okay, when we're thinking, um, I'm going to become a lawyer, right? I'm going to acquire these skills and this power. I'm asking myself what's really the Bildings Roman question. Uh, and this is particularly for my English majors, <laughs> but a building's roman, a novel of development. If you think Dickens, if you think Great Expectations, Pip in Great Expectations, that's a novel of development, a building's roman. Okay. 
This is essentially the Bildungsroman question. How am I to live in the world, for good or for ill? Okay. This is an often unspoken question in law school, where so many other things seem to take pre precedence. Right? We're worried about grades and jobs and, and salaries, but it's a question that we all have to face. What kind of practitioner will I become? Where will I find the kind of fierce joy that Harry finds in his seeker role? And most importantly, what will I do with this power that I am acquiring? Right, so you, you are going to be in a special position, especially those of you who are the first ones in your family to go to law school. Uh, people will be looking to you, right, because you have power. Right? So these uh, seven Harry Potter books, the series of books, can be read collectively as one overarching buildings roman or novel of development. Okay? And the process of development is very similar um, into the process that law students follow in learning to think like a lawyer. Right? Knowledge is power in the most literal sense at Hogwarts and also in law school. Students at Hogwarts are selected for an elite education, although the acceptance letter arrives by OWL rather than by ordinary mail. They face a tough, tough curriculum, grueling exams, and terrifying teachers. Snape is the frighteningly Socratic teacher who lives to humiliate students. Harry and his friends must learn to negotiate the process of becoming more and more powerful, while at the same time they are feeling powerless as lowly students within the hierarchy of the educational institution. So for law students in particular, there is a great resonance in the Harry Potter stories. Harry's epic story, which is spread across years of intensive study, reflects many of the same fears, hardships, and struggles that you all face during your time in law school. Law school and wizard school are process-oriented. You move through a process of early self-doubt and anxieties into a growing knowledge that not all answers are in books, and to a confidence in your ability to think like a lawyer or think like a wizard and also a self-confidence in trusting yourself to do the right thing. Okay. When Harry is accepted into Hogwarts, he worries, like many new law students, that there's been some horrible mistake. A wizard? Him? How could he possibly be? He also frequently wonders if the sorting hat put him in the right house. Should he be in Slytherin instead of Gryffindor? Similarly, many law students secretly worry that they may be uncovered as imposters. Could they really be good enough to compete with all these other obviously bright and talented students? While the sorting hat places students into one of four houses based on abilities, Gryffindor for the brave, um, Ravenclaw for the bright, right, Hufflepuff for the loyal, Slytherin for the ambitious, Law, stu law students get sorted even become, before they, excuse me, before they come to law school, uh, we sort pr prospective students by LSAT scores, right, by undergraduate grades, by applicant essays, and we also sort students once they are in law school, right, by course grades, by membership in the law review, by moot court competitions. Law school admissions committees sometimes can be philosophically more like Helga Hufflepuff, uh, depending on the school's mission and perhaps commitment to hard work and diversity, or more like Rowena Ravenclaw, maybe just focus totally on numbers, you know, scores, LSAT scores, grades. And the sorting process is not unproblematic because grades are not perfect reflections of ability. Too much sorting and emphasis can create a debilitating cutthroat atmosphere. The sorting hat warns of these dangers in The Order of the Phoenix when it sings a song. And I always think the song should be retitled Lament of the Admissions Committee. Listen closely to my song. Though I condemned I am to split you, still I worry that it's wrong. Though I must fulfill my duty and quarter every year, still I wonder whether sorting may not bring the end I fear. Law students are already a pretty competitive bunch. And the sorting process that starts with admissions and continues throughout all the years of law school can provoke as intense rivalries among students jostling for top positions as those that we see between Gryffindor and Slytherin. You need to say a word about gunners and gut courses. Harry and Ron began as rather average students, but Hermione is clearly a gunner from day one. 
and, and I love her for that. I love her for that. Gunners in law student parlance are those partly despised and partly feared students who constantly raise their hands to every question in class who are overprepared. And uh, this is the kind of student who in uh, one of my contracts classes, I remember teaching, uh, the student raised his hand and said, Professor, in this 19th century case about sheep shearing that's in footnote 23, um, what effect did the, uh, the, um, ex the exchange rate of wool have on the, the breach of contract damages? <laughs> to which I think I said something like, that's a great question. You should go research that and report back to us. Um, that, that's, a, that's a gunner, right? That's a gunner's question. But interestingly, Hermione seems to be the only gunner in the school. Um, this is quite different from law schools, where any given class might have a number of gunners shooting up their hands uh, at every opportunity. As a result of the prevalence of gunners, one popular game we used to play in law school was gunner bingo. You would fill out a bingo card with names of all the gunners in the class. Oh, I see some smiles. This might still be a thing. I don't know. And then um, you would check the box each time one of the gunners spoke in class. And then in order to win, you had to raise your hand and work the word bingo into the answer. So, uh, Professor, uh, once you have uh, offer acceptance and consideration, then bingo, you have a contract. Okay. So, gunner bingo required a class with a lot of gunners, but we never had a shortage. And Hermione seems to be the solitary gunner at Hogwarts. She would do well at law school. Unlike Ron and Harry, she lives and breathes her studies. She is f completely focused on uh, her work. She's well organized. She draws up strict study schedules and color codes her notes. I remember being completely intimidated by seeing one of my friends first year had a color coded loose leaf binder of notes for civil procedure and the binder was bigger than the, the case book. <laughs> um, the first year students at Hogwarts don't usually um, have much choice in their, their courses, just like uh, first year law students typically don't have a lot of choice. First year Hogwarts students will take potions, transfigurations, and defense against the dark arts. First year law students might be taking contracts, uh, procedure, legal writing, torts, and the like. Um, I do have to just point out this one example from How to Get Away with Murder, which I just, whenever I see this scene, I just have to sigh. <laughs> Viola Davis will be at the front of some packed courtroom and she'll ask a question and every student will raise their hand, every single student. And I was like, well, I wish this would actually happen. This, this especially with second and third year students, sometimes you have to work a little harder to get them to raise their hand. Um, but that's perhaps a little bit uh, unrealistic. Okay, uh, law school education is a form of initiation into the mysteries of the law and it's also a rite of passage. It's perilous and exhilarating. Strong bonds are formed under such conditions, like the bond formed between Harry, Ron, and Hermione. There are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other, and knocking out a 12-foot mountain troll is one of them, right? Or studying for first-year exams is another one, I would, I would add. Okay, uh, a word about uh, the teaching method, Socratic teaching and uh, learning by doing. In a famous scene from the film The Paper Chase, John Houseman engages in a, a little Socratic method with uh, one of the law students who does not do very well. And Houseman calls the student up to the front and gives him a dime and says, call your mother. Tell her there is serious doubt about your becoming a lawyer. Okay. Uh, wow, it's quite harsh. Uh, Snape would give Kingsfield a run for his money in the humiliating your student Olympics. Snape frequently insults and embarrasses students in front of their peers. He's perhaps the nightmare version of the Socratic professor. The Socratic Ooh. method is legendary as the traditional technique for law school teaching. Under this method, the professor, like Socrates, engages in a line of directed questioning with the students, hoping to encourage them to think through difficult problems analytically. In its worst form, though, it can be a tool for humiliation, where a teacher with a great deal of knowledge hides the ball from a student with lesser knowledge, and Snape plays this game with a vengeance. He constantly asks Harry questions to which Harry can't possibly know the answer. Snape abuses the Socratic method. But that behavior would really be beyond the pale in today's law school classroom, and it would probably result in uh, the student going right up to the dean's office right after class and having a little chat. Significantly, almost all of the teachers at Hogwarts use some form of practical application in their teaching. The one exception seems to be the history of magic teacher, whose sole technique is the lecture. 
he is so boring and his routine is so set, he actually died one day during class and didn't notice and his ghost simply got up and continued teaching. So very, you know, very boring, completely uh, lecturing. Everyone else in Hogwarts teaches by having the students actually put the lessons into practice. So Professor Lupin has the students put away their books and use a wand to face a Bogart. Professor McGonagall has them transfigure a beetle into a button or a mouse into a snuff box. The use of application of practical knowledge is something law students do in clinical courses. Uh, the infamous McCrate Report, published by the American Bar Association in 1992, and it was followed up also by the Carnegie Report um, um, just a few years ago, both reports heavily criticized law schools for placing too much emphasis on theory and too little on skills training. Uh, undoubtedly, any course that focused on something like Harry Potter and the law would be the first to go under the McCrate Report. Um, but at Hogwarts, it's only evil teachers, like the despicable Professor Umbridge, who want to focus on theory at the expense of practice. But of course, students actually need both practice and theory. As social psychologist Kurt Lewin noted, there is nothing so practical as a good theory. Theory helps us craft effective action. Hogwarts students, though, just like law students, show a great enthusiasm for professors who have been practitioners. There's nothing that be beats the mystique of real life experience. So with Professor Moody, Fred and George were in awe of him. Um, he knows, man, they said. He knows what it's like to be out there doing it, said George impressively. Right? So practitioners have this mystique to them. One of the most interesting teachers Harry has is not even a human, but a centaur. Firen seems to be a very postmodern teacher and perhaps a bit of a critical legal studies professor at heart in his disavowal of any transcendent systems of knowledge. He was nothing like any human teacher Harry ever had. His priority did not seem to be to teach them to learn or to teach them what he knew, but rather to impress upon them that nothing, not even a centaur's knowledge, was foolproof. Okay, a word about books and knowledge. Um, Scott Turow, who wrote a wonderful memoir about the first year of law school at Harvard, uh, it was called 1L, um, he famously described the process of reading cases during law school as like stirring concrete with my eyelashes. I love that description, like stirring concrete with my eyelashes. Grinding away at studies is one of the givens of a law school education and of a wizard's education. So trying to master the infamously difficult rule against perpetuities is on a par with mastering the recipe for polyjuice potion. So books are sources of power in law school. Right? And they look, they look like they're powerful. When we look at when you get your first your first set of books in law school, that they looked so powerful. Like this is this is the wisdom, right, that I'm going to learn. Um, but they're also potentially dangerous. In the prisoner of Azkaban, Harry's book, The Monster Book of Monsters, actually bites him. And Tom Riddle's diary, of course, provides, uh, proves especially dangerous. And similarly, cases and statutes can be used for good or for ill. So books, law books, magical books, are filled with secrets. Part of the process of education is learning how to decipher those words of power. But another part is recognizing exactly how far books will take you and the extent of their limitations. Hermione is clearly a book person. She's always in the library, uh, you know, trying to find the answer. But by the time of the events of Order of the Phoenix, she tells Ron, we've gone past the stage where we can just learn things out of books. Law students, too, must face that difficult and challenging moment when they realize there may be no clear-cut answer in the books. Exams, Hogwarts exams. Hogwarts exams are a combination of written and practical tests. Students have to write long essays explaining the history of the Goblin Rebellion and also make a pineapple tap dance across a table. Exams loom large for law students as well. First year exams are particularly stressful with the grade for the entire course resting on one examination. Uh, and there's an old saw actually about law school grades. You might have run across this. The A students become, maybe you haven't heard this. Who do the A students become? No, no, 
the professors, the A students become the professors because they love the law. They live the law. They become the professors. The B students <laughs> become the practitioners. They're good, solid students. They make a lot of money. The C students, who might have other skills, political skills, or they, they become the judges and they lord it overall. And this seems to be the case in the world of Harry Potter. Um, Dumbledore was one of the smartest wizards of all time, but he only wanted to be headmaster. The scholastically average Weasley twins, tw uh, Fred and George, leave school early to make a mint of money in their joke shop. Mediocrities like Fudge end up as Minister of Magic. So uh, just a word about uh, academic culture and formalities of dress and settings and appearance. Um, at Hogwarts, the students are f dressed fairly formally. They're wearing their robes, right, their, their uniforms. Um, law students, in contrast, no longer wear suits and ties to class. Unless they have an interview scheduled that day, that's how you know someone has an interview is they're dressed up. I remember my grandfather, my, my grandfather being appalled when he saw me heading out to class in blue jeans and a t-shirt. And he was even more shocked when I said some of my teachers wear jeans. So the formalities of law school are perhaps uh, a little less, except in one area, which is architecture. Boy, um, let me show you a couple of uh, photos and see if you can pick out which one of these is Hogwarts and which of these are law schools. And you say, ah, oh, that's a trick question. They're all law schools. <laughs> These are all law schools. This is the reading room um, where I went to law school up there. It looks like Hogwarts, right? But uh, this type of architecture is reminiscent of medieval castles. Um, a lot of law schools opt, opt for this kind of look in their buildings, particularly the library, because the setting suggests a sacred place, a cathedral of learning, right? a place filled with power a strong and entrenched institution. And the majestic architecture of Hogwarts and also of law schools metonymically represents the power and privilege of the place. Okay, so answering this building's room on question, how am I to live in the world for good or for ill? We have to think about book seven, The Deathly Hallows. Rowling begins this concluding book in the Harry Potter series with two epigraphs, a quote from Aeschylus's ancient and bloody Greek tragedy, The Libation Bearers, and a quote from the Quaker William Penn's More Fruits of Solitude. And it's worthwhile considering these quotes in some de depth for their insights into the rule of law. Right. Bless the children, give them triumph now, the chorus prays in the quote from The Libation Bearers. And Electra and Orestes dutifully plot matricide in their re revenge-based society. For they must needs be present that love and live in that which is omnipresent. Right? The quote from William Penn offers consolation in the face of death. Love and friendship never perish, being part of the divine. Now these two quotations are actually very apt for their resonance with the rule of law. So the libation bearers, this is the second play in the Oresteia trilogy. And it's the story of a blood feud that destroys the ill-fated family of the house of Atreus. The trilogy is often taught in law and literature courses and it broadly features a transformation in society, a movement from a vengeance-based society to a rule of law society. It's a study in jurisprudence. In the first play, Queen Clytemnestra kills her husband, Agamemnon, as revenge for his killing of their daughter, Iphigenia. In the second play, The Libation Bearers, the remaining children plot the death of Queen Clytemnestra and her new husband. So the children, Electra uh, and Orestes, Electra urges her brother to avenge their father's death by killing their mother, which he does. But then he's tormented by the Furies for the crime of matricide. And the third play is The Trial of Orestes. Does Orestes deserve continued torment by the Furies for killing his mother when it was his duty to avenge the death of his father? A jury of Athenians hears the case, and it's a hung jury. But Athena is the judge, and she casts the deciding vote in favor of mercy. So the spiral of vengeance comes to an end. Now at first blush, this 
uh, this this bloody uh, trilogy um, from by Aeschylus bears little resemblance to this quote from William Penn. Uh, William Penn um, was the benevolent Quaker founder of Pennsylvania. He also was responsible for protecting the early right to trial by jury. Um, but his excerpt is talking about um, the transformations and that that happen with death and the idea that love will transcend death. So both of these deal with systemic changes in the world. Both openings excerpts resonate with uh, the idea of a systemic change. The blood vengeance of the libation bearers gives way to a legal system of reason tempered by mercy. The dark human fear that death is a final end gives way to Penn's vision of undying love. So what do these epigraphs have to do with Harry Ryan and Hermione, Hermione and, and with us as you know, lawyers and law students? They're key to understanding the children's quest and to understanding the transformative goals and the limits of a law school education. A new worldview, a transformation that comes from within can change the very idea of victory for Harry as well as for young lawyers. Hermione says, Harry, why didn't Dumbledore tell you? Why wouldn't he have told you about the Deathly Hallows? And he responds, Hermione, you've got to find it out for yourself. It's a quest. Okay. There was a sea change in book seven. This is the only book not set at, at Hogwarts. And the new setting marks a great seismic shift, which presages the coming transformation of worldview. Ron, Harry, and Hermione have left school to fight against Vol Voldemort. And like the children in the libation bearers, their goal is a death. Essentially, they're on a mission to kill Voldemort. All that is familiar and comforting, including Hogwarts itself, a place Harry views as home, is now dangerous and perverse. At, student, at Hogwarts, students practice torture skills on other students. They use the Cruciatus curse on those who've earned attention. Only pure blood wizards and witches are entitled to education. Death eaters are teachers. Education is upside down. The perversion of education is that it can become indoctrination. Harry, as a questing hero, will be transformed by his journey, but only after great suffering. On his quest, he finds that one by one, he's being stripped of all his sources of power. His wand is broken. His best friend, Ron, deserts him. And Harry's core belief in Dumbledore is severely shaken. Why couldn't Dumbledore just have told him what to do? Right? Has his Hogwarts education failed him? Harry comes to understand that in order to make the greatest paradigm shift of all, the move from childhood to adulthood, you've got to find out for yourself. Thinking for yourself, like thinking like a lawyer, is a leap into a new world, a transformation into a newer self. Harry has learned his lesson at Hogwarts, but Hogwarts cannot teach him everything. His most difficult lesson comes when he decides not to act. That's really hard for Harry. He does not race Voldemort to get the Elder Wand. That's very out of character for him. He sits still. As a seeker in Quidditch and a very active hero in the first six books, he has been in near constant motion. But outward physical activity is not always the right decision. He suffers through his own sea change when he makes the conscious decision to do nothing to retrieve the elder, elder wand. Law students as well may come to the point where they reach the limits of formal education. Often these moments are ethical dilemmas which arrive during uh, summer jobs or clerkships. And at these points, the young lawyer's decisions shape the type of person, both professionally and personally, they become. Right? You are not without power. Your legal education will serve you in good stead. But the answer to a quest is not something to be learned in school, but something to be found within. So I'm going to thank you and take any questions that you might have now. So.
Okay, great question. The question is, uh, what types of readings will be on a law and literature uh, uh, syllabi? And there's a wide variety of answers to the, that. I can tell you what I, ha what I, ha I have on mine. I usually have um, uh, a mixture of nonfiction and fiction. So I start with some cases. We read cases as literature, law as literature, especially Cardozo. Benjamin Cardozo is a great literary judge. Whenever you're reading one of his cases, you get excited because you know this will be good. He's going to be pushing the envelope, and he's gonna, it's going to be well written. We start with cases. Um, I do some slave diary excerpts. Um, we also um, do poetry. We do W.H. Auden, Law Like Love. Um, always do some Shakespeare, often The Merchant of Venice, uh, sometimes Measure for Measure, because in Measure for Measure, there's, there's a wonderful you know, uh, uh, discussion about uh, what is the role of law and what happens if the person in charge of the law is really evil. <laughs> they should not be in charge of the law. Um, and then I also include some children's literature because children are learning about the rule of law when they read The Pokey Little Puppy. Right? They learn how to be socialized into society. They learn how they're supposed to act. And then we also do some films. Uh, Thin Blue Line is a wonderful film if you've never seen it. It's a fantastic documentary. And this guy who was on death row, because of the film, um, gets released. That's an example where art actually did a better job than the legal system, the Thin Blue Line. Um, and then how to get away with murder. That's always fun, too. So those are some things, yes. Yeah. Other questions? Great question. Um, the question was, uh, you said Harry and law students often feel that they're imposters. Um, is there any, any suggestions for overcoming that? And here's, here's one thing you have to remember. Everyone else is feeling that too. Okay? You are not alone. Uh, what happens in law school is we get all these bright students who are used to being at the top of their class, and all of a sudden they're in a class where everyone was used to being at the top of their class. So you just have to keep reminding yourself, I am not alone. <laughs> right? Other people are feeling this way as well. And you do deserve to be here. You do deserve to be here. Uh, you, you folks, um, some of you, you said you're the first ones in your family going to law school. Uh, sometimes you will be the first one, the first lawyer in your community. You might be in an area that was not served by a lawyer before. Um, and you'll be hanging up your shingle and uh, you know, offering the law to people who did not have access to it before. But yes, you do deserve to be here. Yes. Any other questions? Nope. Well, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I love to talk about Harry Potter and law and literature. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you.